She said, oh, I'm not even, oh, sorry. <laughs> wait, wait, oh, we can't go, oh, it's going, oh, wait, can we go back? Oh, wait, okay, I gotta go really fast then. Okay, oh, no, it's gonna, we missed the first one. It might be the best one, sorry. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna wait for the second one to come in. But this picture was about the Bogoth. That's all I can say. Okay, I'm starting. Tim Kinsella once wrote, anything I can make, oh, anything I can mistake in the dark for being what I'm looking for is good enough for me. This is exactly how I feel about you. Take it in, take it in. There's some pauses, it's okay. The first time I ever hit black ice on an eastbound highway and rolled a gray Dodge caravan into a small valley, causing me to crash through the exit sign 615 was inside of you. Chris and Zoe both survived, so did I. It was just one minor cut and glass-filled hair between the three of us. I never told you I was sorry, but I am. Thanks. You are a man of philosophy, a great mind, a unique thinker. I've listened to your stories about entering into the fourth dimension to avoid the banality of a working day, but when given special light-sensitive 3D glasses, a household flashlight, and, um, and a glass or two of wine, you made the fifth, maybe sixth, or seventh dimension. You are an attempt to represent the visual quality of strong, strong light, possibly the type of light that might be associated with alien abduction or some equi equivalent paranormal type activity. One light was just not sci-fi enough for me. Three lights, whoever seemed to do the job. You are my mother's mother. You are my Nona. And although you were not born a Nona, and you only picked it up in the second half of your life, it came to you with a kind of ease, as if you've been practicing since birth. This is on your 84th-ish birthday. I've started to lose track because I think you're going to live forever. Sometimes it takes a photograph to fully understand just how much a person really glows. And this is you, and you are glowing. Unfortunately, my limited photographic skills don't know how to compensate for such a glow. <laughs> and the exposure of every photograph I take of you starts to look like this. We are on the parameters of the floral clock, a real Niagara Falls touristic oddity. I was playing the part of a photographer, and your role was depicting the photographer's assistant. And even though we both didn't really know what we were doing, we played the parts as best we could. We were actors of the stage, and our stage, in this instance, was grass. You little monsters, lurking deep in the Scarborough suburbs, are surely up to no good. I can see it in the flash's retinal reflection in your wide, wide eyes. I can see it in your poise in your foreshadowed pounce. You didn't look the most well that I think you could have looked. If I had more strength myself, I would have lifted you into the back of my minivan. I would have brought you to my home and told my roommates only after the fact. I'd have believed that this was the best thing for you. I would deny allegations that you were just a pony and that you needed pony-type things, because sometimes I think I know best. The word comforter reminds me too much of the word comfort. And when I look at you, comforter, I feel uncomfortable. Maybe because I know your true tone and your heat trapping abilities. Maybe because I subconsciously suppress the details of the last time I laid out on you. I remember riding my bike in Savannah, Georgia, a brown Raleigh supercourse circa 1970. We were trailing an open roof double-decker tour bus somewhere near a roundabout that led to the childhood home of Flannery O'Connor. Over a loudspeaker, the tour guide warned us tourist types not to touch you, but how could we resist? Nothing's as tempting as Spanish moss. Um, where am I? This was on your old street in your old city, in a park across from your old house in a primarily Hasidic neighborhood. I found you this sunspot and told you to do that specific tilt of your head. I told you to open your mouth too, just a bit. I wanted to see your teeth. It was in Jamestown, Rhode Island, that you risked the life of Brian's Super 8 camera. You wanted to get a certain shot for your thesis project, and that certain shot had to be shoulder deep in the ocean. I'm sure the naked onlookers would have laughed at the sight of a saltwater Super 8. Admittedly, I'd have laughed too. There was something particular about the way your flowers wilted in the night. It was as if they were sleeping or settling in 
or becoming a nighttime introvert. I just wanted to make a simple photograph of you, but somehow that required three strobes, two soft, soft boxes, both a Hasselblad and a 4x5 camera, <laughs> fog machine, multiple extension cords, three stands, two tripods, a flashlight, and other things I must be forgetting. You'd make a good pirate. <laughs> You'd make a good coat rack. You'd make a good resting place for a sloth. You'd make a good reality TV contestant. You'd certainly make a good moment good. I met you two in the deep, deep south. You lived in a Walmart parking lot, as did I, in a minivan for the duration of the evening. Distance-wise, this is as close as we got, although I'd like to believe, regardless of physical proximity, that we were much closer than just this. Rolling in the dirt is an instinctual act for a llama, and you are a llama, and a very proud llama, and you too roll in the dirt, instinctually, that's why I like you so much. I'm sorry that you live gated in life outside of the Big Apple, and not the Big Apple as in New York, but the literal Big Apple, a real Canadian, a landmark that sits off of the 401. <laughs> you called me in Niagara Falls soon after this, and before I left Montreal to tell me that maybe we shouldn't speak for a while. Maybe it was, be, uh, maybe, oh, that maybe a break, oh, I can't read this, sorry. Maybe silence, anyways. Um, I didn't know what to say, so I agreed, and maybe you were right, but that was a very long drive, departing Niagara Falls and arriving in Montreal six hours later. I've always described you as a demon seed, and by that, I just mean there's a small seed planted deep within you, and every now and then a demon grows out of it and takes over your physical and mental well-being. I don't think it's your fault, and it's not entirely you. It's part you, part demon. But over time, I've come to adore equally the both of you. <laughs> 